notice this representation in the admissions. I, I don't believe this is what I admitted. I mean, obviously I signed it, um, but that is not what I um, understood the report was going to be. And that was an answer, of course, filed with this commission to the complaint, correct? Yes, sir, it was. Now, in your response to the Grievance Committee uh, on December 28th, you talked about um, the, that information particularly. And uh, I'll, I'll direct you there so that we don't have to uh, speculate over the language. Two, it is Exhibit 233, please. 233? Yes. Yes, sir. Go to page four of that, please. Yes, sir. And on the third paragraph down, it says, I readily concede that I was informed by Dr. Meehan prior to May 12, 2006, that DNA security testing of samples in this case revealed the presence on the victim of male DNA that did not match any of the cross players, correct? Yes, sir. And less than a week earlier, you had told a reporter for the New York Times, obviously anything that is not DNA from people who are charged is potentially exculpatory information. Yes, sir. There's no question it's potentially exculpatory. And it's obviously, that's what you said, that it was obviously potentially exculpatory information if there's DNA that does not match. I believe that's what I just said. Right. And in your bar complaint, you deny recognizing at the time that the unidentified male DNA on Ms. Mangum was potentially exculpatory. I thought that I denied that, I, that it was exculpatory. Right. Your, your answer, I'm sorry, to the bar complaint. Did I say that it was not potentially exculpatory or was it not specifically exculpatory? I'd make one objection. This is a pleading of a lawyer. It's not been verified. In most civil cases, you know, you have a verified pleading with a sworn statement. So, you know, this is the, the attorney's uh, work product. Okay. It's uh, a binding admission. What are you, what are you referring to? I mean, if you could give me a reference. Okay. Take back. Well, one. well, let me ask. Let me ask a question this way, Mr. Mayfong. Yes, sir. When you were sitting with Dr. Meehan, and he was going through this unidentified male DNA that not, did not match any of the cross players, did you realize at the time that it was exculpatory, or at least potentially exculpatory? Well, certainly, any evidence is potentially exculpatory because the only way you can determine the exculpatory value of evidence is to view it in light of other evidence in the case. So something that may not have any obvious exculpatory value might, in light of other evidence, be exculpatory. That was kind of the basis of Collins versus Whitley. Um, the problem is, as I indicated, that there was specifically exculpatory information to test. That is, none of the DNA on these red kit items matched any of the Duke players. That is specifically exculpatory. If there had been evidence that matched with respect to the fingernail, there was uh, DNA on one of the fingernails that matched uh, David Evans. That is specifically inculpatory. Now, the presence of other DNA is not specifically exculpatory because since, as Dr. As, as indicated, Dr. Meehan said, and I believe as he testified, you can't determine when it was deposited, how long it's been there, where it came from, then its relationship to this particular case is impossible. So it is, it is potentially exculpatory only because there may be some way it could be used in, in conjunction with other evidence, but it doesn't prove either that an assault did not take place or that the specific people involved in this complaint did not commit the assault. The absence of DNA evidence does not prove either that an assault took place or that a person didn't commit it. The presence of DNA from someone other than the people who are, are charged in the crime doesn't mean that they committed the crime or that the crime wasn't committed. 
So you're saying that the fact that there's male DNA on a alleged rape victim that does not match the suspect is not exculpatory? Yes, sir. Give me, I mean, as an example. That's your answer. Yes, sir. Don't argue it. Let him make his answer. I mean, the, some, a piece of DNA or a segment of DNA that fell within that very category was the vaginal swab, sperm fraction that was recovered that did not match any of the players. It did, however, match the victim's boyfriend. The victim's boyfriend was not involved either in a sexual assault on her on that night or, for that matter, in sexual activity with her on that day. So that's an example of something that does not match the players. DNA found in her body does not match the players. That is not exculpatory because the fact she had sex with her boyfriend three days earlier doesn't prove anything about what happened that night. But this information didn't match the boyfriend who she claimed to have sex with, correct? That is correct. Right. Go ahead. We apologize. We're having some problems with that video feed from the North Carolina Court of Appeals building. We're going to check back in with them just as, oh, but there we go. All right. That is an exotic dancer, stripper, whatever you want to call it. Her business involves bodily contact with lots of men who are strangers to her. And it would be surprising probably if there was not DNA from men on her clothing, just as in Dr. Meehan's example, it would be surprising if a kindergarten teacher didn't have DNA from her students. So I'm getting confused. Is the unidentified male DNA that was found on Ms. Mangum, are you now saying that's not potentially exculpatory? No, sir. I'm saying that the difference between exculpatory and potentially exculpatory is that something that is clearly exculpatory would be something like there's no DNA from Duke Cross players there. That is exculpatory. It doesn't prove they didn't commit the crime, but it is exculpatory because it shows that there is no evidence that they did. However, the presence of other DNA in and of itself would not be exculpatory. As a matter of fact, I mean, you could even question how it would be used at trial. If you wanted, I suppose you could use it to impeach the testimony of the victim or something if she denied having sexual contact or having any kind of contact with other men or something like that. But you can't tell how a piece of evidence can be used in an exculpatory fashion without seeing how it's fit into other things. I'm saying that there are probably lots of ways that you could use that evidence in an exculpatory fashion, but none of them are immediately apparent from the existence of the evidence. Well, that type of evidence is certainly potentially exculpatory. Wouldn't you agree? I thought that I had agreed with that. Did you recognize it at the time you met with Dr. Meehan as potentially exculpatory? I said that I did not recognize it as specifically exculpatory. You said it was non-inculpatory. Non-inculpatory. In other words, I didn't think it proved anything at all about this case in light of the profession of the victim and also in light of the fact that no determination, no conclusions could be drawn about where the evidence came from, how long it had been there, anything like that. Well, hold on a second. Putting aside any semantic distinctions between exculpatory, potentially exculpatory, non-inculpatory, non-exculpatory, didn't you recognize the first time you heard that because it was something that he found that the SBI didn't find, that you were specifically looking for DNA, didn't a light bulb go off in your head like, whoa, what is that? No, sir. I wouldn't say that happened. I certainly specifically recognized that it was information to which they were entitled for the reasons you said. Well, wait. Well, go ahead. Because he found it in his testing and they were entitled to all the results of the testing. And so there's no question that they were entitled to have it, whether you count it as exculpatory or not. But in light of the fact that when we talked about, you know, the fact that how DNA is transferred, how the fact that no determination can be about how long it had been there or anything like that, the best sample that he got, he estimated, was at least three days old. So did I view this as having any 
involvement whatsoever in this case? I can't say that I did. Clearly it was something that they were entitled to have, but its probative value in this case never struck me as having any significance whatsoever. Putting aside whether it was discoverable or not, now you just said it didn't hit you as having probative value in the case. That's right? That was your reaction? Yes, sir. I didn't think it proved anything at all about the facts and circumstances of what occurred on March 13th and 14th, that evening. But again, putting aside discoverability, that was something that you, as far as developing the case, didn't feel like it was important to follow up on to find out who were these unidentified males, how did that DNA get there, how is that going to affect my case, how am I going to be able to prove my case in court, knowing at some time the existence of unidentified males' DNA on these articles of intimate clothing and so forth is going to be known. Didn't you feel like that was something that you needed to follow up on just as a matter of preparation for trial and your trial strategy and being convinced that indeed there had been a crime committed? Didn't you feel like you had to follow up on that? Yes, sir, we did. We went out and got a sample from the boyfriend. There were other samples that were identified. Anybody that we thought might have had any contact, we submitted those samples. But the actual significance of it, I'm not saying that we didn't try to figure out who it was or anything like that. I'm just saying that it wasn't something that was so prevalent in my mind about an issue that I had to deal with that I thought about it much after the initial thing. We knew that there were other things to come in. I just didn't really think about it anymore at that time. Going back to your mindset at that time, and I think you said this in your response to the bar, you were looking for evidence that supported the inference that there was a crime and that one or more members of the lacrosse team committed it, right? That's what you were looking for. My specific intent when we sent the stuff over was to find out if they could resolve the mixtures on some of the evidence, including the fingernails. So that was my most pressing concern because that is specifically the reason that Mr. Budzinski told me that YSTR analysis could exist in this case. At the same time, we had the DSI lab repeat the testing of the rape kit items on which we knew that there was no sperm or semen, so we knew there had not been an ejaculation in the time frame of this event to see if there were other things, other DNA from males that could be identified. And it's kind of like fingerprints in the sense that if there had been DNA from a lacrosse player there, then the presumption would be that there was only one time that that DNA could have been left because she did not go to that house and dance for those players all the time. So it's the same kind of thing as if you find my fingerprints are going to be in this courtroom after this week. Before this week, my fingerprints couldn't have been in this courtroom because I'd never been here. The fact that you find my fingerprint in this courtroom isn't of any particular significance unless you can connect it to a time when I would have been here to do it. So with respect to the lacrosse players, their DNA, if there was no assault, they should have had no DNA on any of the clothing or items in the rape kit of the victim in this case. And, in fact, they did not. Right. So, but the reason that it was being tested was to determine whether there was any such evidence because that would be probative or at least suggestive of potential guilt. There was no such evidence. The fact that she had male DNA on her, on the other hand, was not suggestive that somebody else had committed this crime or suggestive that the crime hadn't taken place. It was simply a fact that was there and a fact that should have been reported. 
I think you told me more than I asked. I'm sorry. But maybe you didn't tell me what I asked, which is your mindset. Is it fair to say you were looking for evidence that linked the players to the rape and weren't looking for evidence that broke the link? I don't think that's necessarily true. The perfect result in this case would have been to find fresh sperm or fresh semen, whether or not that was identified with any lacrosse player or even not identified, because that would show that there had been sexual contact. If there were no lacrosse players or no person that we could identify associated with that, then that would have meant there would have been no charges. That would have been a specifically exculpatory event that would have prevented any charges having been brought, because it would have shown that there was some kind of sexual contact, but that none of these people that we were looking at were involved. So that, you know, had there been such evidence, that would have been good news, because it would have resolved the case. The problem is that the evidence that you're asking about was not evidence, in my mind, that resolved the case. It was nothing that got us to that. So it wasn't about it being exculpatory or inculpatory. Well, evidence doesn't have to resolve the case to be important evidence in the case. True. In other words, you don't have to have the smoking gun to have important evidence, do you? No, sir, you don't. Well, just tell me this. Did you consider that the DNA of the unidentified individuals, of course, other than the boyfriend, that you already knew about the consensual intercourse and there was a match, did you consider that there was follow-up work to be done to identify both the source of the DNA, that is, who put it there, and also when it got there, and also how it got there? Was that something that needed to be followed up on? Well, whether it needed to be followed up or not, I think my answer would be that, generally speaking, the only way you can ask the questions of when something got there and how something got there or if you identify who it came from. And we were submitting samples in an attempt to determine who any DNA came from, but absent that, I mean, the reason, for instance, that we know when the boyfriend's DNA got there was because he could tell us, she could tell us. But without knowing who that came from, we couldn't know when it got there or how it got there. And so the first step in determining when or how something got there is to determine what its source of origin is, and you can only do that to the extent that you have a sample, a reference sample you can submit for testing. Mr. Williamson just asked you, but what I'm wondering is, did you not at any point stop to think, you hadn't indicted, let's assume for purposes of this question that you knew this on April the 10th before anybody was indicted. So did you not stop to think, this could be the perpetrators. This DNA could belong to the perpetrators, and so we've got some serious investigative work to do to make that determination. No, ma'am, it did not occur to me that that DNA could belong to the perpetrators. I thought that in light of the explanations given by Dr. Meehan with respect to DNA transfer and things like that, that it was very unlikely that that DNA came from anyone who would have committed this offense. We didn't know that, but I thought it was highly unlikely. Thank you. Mr. Nifon, you have known for many years that the existence of male DNA on an alleged rape victim that does not match the accuser is not only potentially exculpatory, but it's actually exculpatory. I think that you can't know what the result of any evidence is without seeing context. I mean, if 
for instance, there's somebody has consensual sex, a woman has consensual sex with her husband, um, and then has um, unconsensual sex with a stranger, the presence of the husband's DNA on the woman would not be uh, exculpatory with respect to the stranger whose DNA matched. Well, you have in fact dismissed charges in the past based on the existence of male DNA on an alleged victim that does not match the accuser of a suspect, haven't you? It is certainly possible that I have in conjunction with other facts. I mean, certainly it is, it is a circumstance to be considered, and without knowing all the facts and circumstances, it would be hard to know exactly what, those, what that situation was. But yes, I'm sure that I probably have done that in cases where that evidence was, in fact, in combination with other evidence, something that specifically excluded um, somebody. You can object and you read it fairly extensive pre trial order. The exhibit's on it. Not being offered in depth. Okay. Just let me see it. Okay. You're not going to offer this as an exhibit, as an exhibit, I think. Hold on, let me look at this. I'll let you ask him um, about these documents for the purposes of impeachment. Yeah, how can it be impeachment if he admitted that he'd done it in times in the past? I don't think he unequivocally admitted it. Okay. This the document I just handed you is a dismissal form for Leroy Samuels Jr. Yes, sir. And it's for first degree rape, first degree sexual offense, and kidney, correct? Uh, and also burglary. And burglary. And yes, those sir. are three of the, the three of those charges are the same charges you brought against uh, the three individuals in the Duke Cross case. Correct? Um, actually I think two of them were the same. The kidnapping, I believe we charged first degree kidnapping in this case. Okay. You, the second degree. You, you charged them. I, I, he said three of the charges were the same. I think two of the charges were the same. And the other offense is charged here as second degree kidnapping. I believe we charged first degree kidnapping. It's a similar offense. You charged the, the cross players in this with rape, sexual, sexual offense, and kidnapping, correct? Yes, sir, I did. <clears throat> and you signed uh, these dismissal forms, which are dated July 7, 2000. That's almost seven years ago. Yes, sir. And the explicitly stated basis for the dismissal was that the results of the DNA testing exclude the defendant as a perpetrator of this crime. Yes, sir, that's what it says. And the DNA evidence that formed the basis for this dismissal uh, was the existence of male DNA that didn't match the accused. I don't know the specific constellation of factors that led to this because I don't recall the specific case. May I approach? It's another um, <laughs> Is it going to be about more details about this specific case? Yes, it is. Uh, I, I think we're going to enough detail about this case. This is for impeachment purposes. We're not establishing um, the facts of the prior case. I, I think that's enough on this case. Can I just be heard briefly on that, Mr. Chair? Just... Um, yes. Okay. The document I want to show him is the actual test results from the SBI, which establishes the basis for the dismissal. And that's um, I think in the interest of moving this along, let's move on. We'll make your point.
When did you form a belief in your own mind that a rape had occurred? Probably on the 27th of March. And what did you have before you that caused you to form that belief? The opinions of two officers and through them the opinion of the same nurse, which was confirmed subsequently. But I believe that I had accepted it at that time. And is it fair to say that up until the time you dismissed the rape charges, you personally believed that a rape had occurred? Yes, sir, I think that's fair. And even after you dismissed the rape charges, you personally believed that a sexual assault had occurred, even if it had not been rape? Yes, sir, I think that's also fair. Did there come a time that your belief that a sexual assault occurred changed? I am aware of the report and have read the report from the Attorney General's office. I had conversations with Mary Coleman, pardon me, Mary Winstead and Jim Coleman during the course of that investigation. I understood their reasons for saying that there was not sufficient evidence to go forward, not sufficient credible evidence to go forward in the case. And based on my knowledge of what they told me, I believe that to be the case. I have not seen all the evidence that they have seen in terms of when they made their conclusion that this was a case of actual innocence. But I don't have any specific reason to question that conclusion at this time. In other words, there's not something that I can say that I disagree with them on. I just don't have sufficient evidence to know at this point anything different from what they said. As you sit here today, do you have a personal belief as to whether or not a sexual assault occurred? At this point, I think what I would be, what I would have to say honestly is I think something happened in that bathroom, but I'm not sure that I can say that I now at this point believe it was a sexual assault. If not a sexual assault, then what? A non-sexual assault, a intimidation, a, you know, something, something happened to make everybody leave that scene very quickly. Okay. I want to ask you a few questions about your early statements. I believe you said you started making the statements at issue here on March 27th. Is that correct? That is correct. And at the time you made those statements, were you aware of any restrictions, ethical or otherwise, on your ability to speak with the press about this case? I was, I would say, generally familiar with the provisions of 3.6 and 3.8. I probably would have been well served to make myself a little bit more specifically familiar with some of those provisions. Did you actually look at Rule 3.6 and or Rule 3.8 at any time before you stopped making those statements? At any time before I stopped making those statements? Before you stopped making the statements. I believe that 
I, I probably looked at the rule at about the same time that I stopped making the statements. About the same time? Yeah, yes, sir. I, I'm, I, I think that I may have looked at the rule because I, of my concern that I needed to stop. What had provoked that concern? Pardon? What had provoked your concern that you might need to stop? I had some non-lawyer friends who were suggesting to me that, um, that they thought that, that I was talking too much. And so I considered that perhaps I had been. And that while I was thinking about these situations, I might want to look at the Now, you had received by fax on, on March 30 from Mr. Cheshire's office, Exhibit 205, where he basically asked you to do exactly that, didn't he? Yes, sir. And um, that particular week was a very busy week, quite possibly the busiest week of my life. I don't know when I first saw that that letter from Mr. Cheshire. It may have been March 31st, the following day. There's, there's a, a, you know, that would have been the earliest I would have seen it. It's also possible that I did not see it uh, until the following Monday, um, or to actually have a chance to read it until the following Monday. That was about the time that I stopped making these statements. Uh, my recollection is that I had decided not to make any more statements by the time that I read Mr. Chester's letter, but I'd made that decision pretty much on the 31st, other than the, state, uh, other than the interviews I'd still already agreed to do. And again, that was after you had received advice from friends, non-lawyer friends, that you ought to stop talking so much. Well, uh, there were some people that thought that I was talking too much. They weren't specifically accusing me of ethical violations, but they, were, they thought that I was maybe saying too much about the case. It's also getting very clear by this time that whatever the intent of the statements were, they weren't having any effect. Nobody was coming forward to talk, apparently, as a result of the statements. So the efficacy of making statements was becoming you know, quite problematic in and of itself. So they weren't working? No, sir, they clearly did not work. Did you, in making the decision to stop making these statements, include in your decision-making process an ethical concern? I don't know that I did. I attempted to, to make the statements in an ethical manner. I think that I failed to do that in some situations, and part of that had to do with my misunderstanding uh, of the situation, uh, of my, of some of the specifics of the rules, perhaps. Um, but the the decision to stop, I don't think was so much because um, I was, I thought that I was um, committing or continuing to commit an ethical violation so much as I, I think that I realized that, that all the consequences, all the potential consequences of my statement might not have been apprehended by me initially. Um, do you have in your office a, a copy of the State Bar Lawyer's Handbook? Yes, sir. I, have, I do have uh, several years worth of that. At any time during your handling of the Dupla Cross cases, did you refer to that to the ethical rules in that handbook for any purpose? I believe that I did, but it was sometime after this this March April period. What do you recall about that? I recall looking at um, specifically Rule 3.8, the duties of the prosecutor, and, um, the, and also the exceptions in, in Rule 3.6 with respect to the kinds of things that I, could, that, I, that I was allowed to say. The 
the specifically enumerated things in Rule 3.6 that yes, you're allowed to say? Well, the, the, things, the things that yeah, – I, I believe that my statements were for a law enforcement purpose, which I believe that I could say. I also believe that I, I could say that investigation revealed that a crime had been committed. I'm not so sure about that. Um, I think it was clearly not something that was within the rules for me to express my personal opinion about some things. And, and I know you touched upon this in your, in your examination, but what was the, the legitimate law enforcement purpose that uh, you believe was being served by these statements? I was attempting to encourage people with information about the crime who were not personally involved to come forward and give um, information to law enforcement. And the way that I was attempting to do that was to appeal to their conscience. Do you believe that that covered all of the statements that you made that are at issue here? No, sir, I don't believe it covered all, every statement that I made. No, sir. Would it cover statements made on, say, the O'Reilly thing? I'm sorry? Would it cover statements, say, made to the O'Reilly factor? I don't recall specifically what statements those were. I saw it on your calendar that you were on the program. Yes, sir, I, I, I do. Oh, you just say talking to somebody other than local media? Is that what you're asking? Yes, yes. Like somebody who watches the O'Reilly factor. Well, first of all, I don't want to make too many assumptions. I don't think too many people in Durham that you were trying to reach to come forward probably watch the O'Reilly Factor. That may be speculation on my part. But what, what's the point of talking to anybody other than local media if the purpose is to get people locally to come forward? Why make it a nationwide pronouncement? Well, certainly I agree that that turned out to be a really bad idea. I, I don't think that it would serve much purpose. There, there were perhaps some exceptions. Uh, Newsweek uh, or ESPN would be things that might be seen locally, but a lot of these places, people, these shows I, I really hadn't heard of. I don't watch a lot of TV. I watch none now, but I didn't watch much at the time. And I, I agree with you. I think that that probably was not a particularly effective way to get that message across. And I believe you stated that you tried to keep separate your statements about the case from your political race that you were involved in. Do you, do you recall that? Well, what I, I believe that indicated was I tried to keep the race from the, the political race from affecting the way the case was handled, or the case from affecting the way the political race was handled. I mean, it, it's impossible to keep the two totally separate. But I did not want to be making decisions, um, you know, to do something or not to do something based on what was getting ready to happen in an election. Well, um, I recall your testimony regarding the endorsements that you might need to, uh, to run an effective campaign. I think that came in, in connection with your testimony regarding that poll that we looked at on March 27th. Um, did you consider in your own mind that uh, any kind of media exposure about this case would be a, a good thing as far as your race was going? Not specifically. I think that it certainly created a lot of interest uh, in the race, and, and um, I think probably more people paid attention to it. I would say that I, I believe that overall in the, in the primary, this case, if it had 
any positive effect. It had an equal or greater negative effect. I mean, I know that there were people who turned out to vote against me because of this case, because they said that to, you know, to people at, uh, at the polling places. Um, it did not, you know, some people suggested that it was done for specific reasons. I did not get the endorsement of the Committee on the Affairs of Black People. I did get the endorsements of the um, People's Alliance and the Friends of Durham, but in the second, in the general election, I had opposition only because of this case, and the Friends of Durham withdrew their endorsement. So um, if it had any political benefit to me prior to May 3rd, and I think that's not at all clear, unless it was to get more people interested in the race and make them pay attention. Clearly, after May 3rd and before the general election, it hurt me very much. As a matter of fact, um, had I been deciding this case or deciding how to handle the case based on politics, uh, the first thing I would have done after the primary would be dismissive. When was the general election? Uh, November the... I'm not well, sure. second Tuesday in November. First Tuesday after the first Monday. First Tuesday, right. Uh, it might have been the second this year. November 7th? Se seventh, second, I don't remember. It could have been. All right. Um, well, you, you made some of these statements regarding the, the Duke Lacrosse cases um, at political uh, functions, did you not? There were some, some um, forums for the race. The district is that what you're talking about, or are you talking well, about? Well, I'm trying to look with my good eye on this board here. And April 11, NCCU forum, didn't we see uh, one of those clips there? Yes, sir. Um, the NCCU forum on April the 11th um, specifically was uh, something that was called. I was I was invited sometime on the pardon on the morning of the 10th by Chancellor Ammons to participate. Also participating were the mayor. Um, there were representatives uh, from the Duke Student Council, the NC Central Student Council. And at the time that I agreed to appear, um, it was basically just a, a, a conference uh, that they were going to talk about, I guess, keeping the lid on. And the whole point was, was to try to avoid we had people who were making comments like, and I think I referenced these earlier, um, if the suspects were members of the uh, NC Central team, they would already all be in jail. And then there were other people that said um, that we shouldn't be looking at the case at all. And so we were trying to keep the lid on. Part of the problem, uh, actually, in terms of that meeting was, was uh, seemed to be responsive to the press conference called by the, uh, pl the players' attorneys on the 10th after they got the first DNA results, uh, announcing that um, everybody was completely exonerated. And, and that was, there, when I walked in on the morning of April the 11th, there was um, a lot of, not exactly hostile, but um, what I would, there was some hostility, but basically I, I would say a highly energized atmosphere. And there were a lot of people that wanted to know about that. And so I tried to explain that the investigation was not over, that the case was still being looked at. And I was attempting to do that to maintain a more harmonious atmosphere in the city of Durham because I was concerned that this was the kind of case that could fuel some difficulty. Did you feel like that press conference called by the defense team was improper? I actually didn't even know about it until the next morning because um, I was at a, at a, uh, a forum. Um, I'm certainly not an expert on what can be done. Um, my understanding had been that it was inappropriate to announce the results of tests, and, and so I know that when uh, news organizations ask me to comment on tests and say I can't speak 
it would be improper for me to speak about the tests. I also understand that they're saying that, that their response they felt was appropriate um, in light of things that I had said. I'm really not the person who can make the judgment about how appropriate their activities were, and, and I'm, not, I'm not here to challenge what they did. I'm just trying to say that it had a practical effect. Let me ask you about the word hooligans. Yes, sir. Um, how, do you, how did you choose that word? I'm not even sure that I can answer that question. Um, it, is, uh, it is a word that, that normally um, is used in, in terms of, of youthful um, gangs, sometimes involving sporting events. You hear it used with soccer crowds and things like that sometimes. Um, and, and I don't know, I, mean, I don't specifically know where the word came from in terms of coming into my head. Um, it was it's a little arcane, isn't it? Arcane. I, I would I would say perhaps not for me, but for most people that would be the case. Um, and it, it came in conjunction with a question that I was asked. Uh, I was talking with a representative for ESPN uh, at that time, and um, I, I said, you know, I would hope that. Uh, somebody who was not involved with this would have the, the decency to, to say, why am I covering up for a bunch of hooligans? It's just a word that popped into my head. It, it turned out to be uh, kind of a buzz, buzzword catchphrase for this whole case. But it wasn't, it, it was a spontaneous moment, not something that was planned. Well, it's true that your understanding is that uh, in our modern usage of that word, it's generally associated with sporting events, isn't it? Uh, Specifically, that, soccer hooligans. I, I believe that that is correct. I, um, well, uh, I want to go to, I think it's the September uh, 22nd um, hearing. And you recall the testimony about what specifically, I, I believe it was Mr. Kingsbury was asking the court that we specifically don't think that the report we have mentions the unidentified male DNA. You recall that? Yes, sir, I know that that's, I don't specifically recall his testimony, but I see it in the transcript. And you testified about that today. And why didn't you immediately, when you heard specifically what he was raising, then go look at the report I can't ask and that see, well, is it in there? I don't know. Certainly, if I'd done that actually much earlier than that hearing, it would have probably saved me a lot of grief. But um, I can't tell you why I didn't do that at that time. I just didn't do it. I wish I had. I wish I'd done it May the 18th, but I didn't. All right. And my recollection of the testimony is a little fuzzy, but I recall after the December 15 hearing, did, did you make some extra, extra judicial statement regarding um, that specific information was withheld based on privacy concerns? I'm not sure exactly what I said because I was asked a question as I was going down the hallway and it was not something as to my recollection. I don't think it was to a camera person. I think it was to a newspaper reporter. What I intended to say was something about um, there was no, no withholding of information and the only concerns um, that were ever involved were privacy concerns, which is what Dr. Meehan had testified were his concerns. That clearly is not what was put in the paper. I can't imagine exactly why I would have said what appeared in the paper, but it did appear in the paper, and I can't specifically deny that I said that. It just doesn't seem to make much sense to me. 
Well, in any event, I've been a little confused. You made, in your response to the bar's grievance, a rationale or a reason why full test results were not provided to the defense was because of the privacy concerns that Dr. Meehan had and was communicated to you, correct? That was the only concern that he ever communicated to me. But my understanding of that concern was that it had just to do with including in his report the DNA profiles of the lacrosse players. That was the only thing that I recall that he ever said that he didn't want to include. And since that was an underlying data kind of thing, that was not either an item tested or a test or a result. It was something that you do in order to make a test. I didn't think that there was a problem with not including that. It was clearly underlying data that could be revealed later on if we ever got to that, but I didn't see it as something that needed to be in the 15A-282 response as I didn't see that obviously most of the underlying data needed to be in that response. Okay. But my question, though, is the privacy concerns. As I understand it, Dr. Meehan finally admitted after some probing that the privacy concerns have nothing to do with the presence of unidentified male DNA. Yes, sir. And do you agree with that? That the privacy concerns? Privacy concerns. Let me put it this way. Privacy concerns have nothing to do with whether the fact that there was DNA from unidentified males that was discovered. It's an oxymoron to say that unidentified males have any privacy concerns because we don't know who they are. I don't disagree. I don't. I guess that since he never asked me about excluding or anything that specific information, and since that doesn't have anything to do with privacy, I never had any expectation that it wouldn't be in the report. Okay. But in any event, you would agree, wouldn't you, that privacy concerns cannot be the basis for any rationale for withholding the fact that the DNA of unidentified males was discovered by Dr. Meehan? I absolutely agree with that. Okay. All right. I believe that's all I have. Mr. Nuffron, I just have a couple questions. Yes, ma'am. You acknowledge that you're with certainty that you were at the April 21st meeting with Dr. Meehan? Yes, ma'am. I'm sure that I went to a meeting on April 21st. I can't remember exactly what was discussed there because of the problem of dealing with trying to remember what part of what I thought was at one meeting was at another. But I was at that meeting, yes, ma'am. And I also want to make sure I understood your testimony on direct. You are certain that at the first meeting, the first contact you had with Dr. Meehan was in person? I'm not certain of that. I just don't recall talking to him on the telephone about anything prior to. I'm not the one that arranged for his lab to do this testing. It's certainly possible that I might have talked to him, but I can't really imagine why I would have done that or the circumstances. And I don't recall. I just can't think of anything that happened that I would remember. It could have happened. I don't recall it. But I believe you testified that at the first meeting you had, he told you about the presence of unidentified male DNA. Yes, ma'am. That is correct. And did I also understand, you may not have testified this, that at that meeting you knew that he did not yet have the fingernails? Actually, I think I found that out at the end of that meeting, which is why I think that there probably was an April 10th meeting, because we were going over the stuff that had been tested, and that was the thing that I was most interested in. And so, you know, he said that they didn't have it yet, and I said, we need to get that to him. I told the police officers, and they did pretty quickly after that. But that's why I think that that probably did occur in April, although I don't, probably on April 10th, although I don't specifically recall being over there three times. But you're certain that you met with Dr. Meehan before he had the fingernails? 
I'm sorry? You're certain that you met with him before he had received those fingernails for testing? At this point, I, believe, I do believe that to be the case, yes, ma'am. Did you ever, we had the pleasure over lunch of, of looking at the April 4th photo, the video of the photo array. Did you ever have that opportunity? Did you ever take that opportunity and, and watch it? I don't know that I can say that I have watched every um, minute of that. I have watched uh, certain, I've probably watched about three quarters of it. Um, I've, I've seen the, the parts that um, I felt were most relevant. I've watched the beginning and things like that to just to get an idea about how it was done. But it, it is not the most entertaining video that one could ever watch. Do you know when you would have done that? Not specifically. The, the tape of that was included in the first batch of discovery that we that we sent out. So we had that fairly early. Um, and I know that at some point, I, I believe that, I'm not sure, if, actually I'm not sure if we put them, we might not, we put some things, we occasionally put things off VHSs onto DVDs, but I don't know that we did that in this case. Uh, we do have a number of, uh, of DVD player you know, television combos and I, the, the place I would normally watch that, and what I did in this case, is in the conference room right across the hall from my office. Um, I saw, I'm sure, at least part of that prior to the first um, discovery compliance, which was May the 18th. How long we'd had it in our office up until that time could have been in the office for maybe two or three weeks before that, so it would have presumably been uh, you know, the second half of April, uh, maybe, um, to the first part of May. So you don't know whether or not you had seen it before the first indictments were issued? I don't specifically know whether I'd seen it. I'd read the transcript. Um, well, I'd read the notes. I'm not sure that actually I'd even read the transcript um, because I'm not sure that the transcript had been prepared by that time. I don't remember the, the date that... Uh, so we got the transcript out. I don't recall right off hand, but it might have been a little after that. I did read the handwritten notes from uh, Investigator Gottlieb, and we discussed it at length. And um, who made the decision prior, at some point prior to April 17th to seek indictments against Mr. Finnerty and Mr. Seligman? Um, I, I made the decision, I guess, would be the best way to say that. I mean, the, we, we discussed it. The officers um, were in agreement to do that, but uh, it, was, it was my decision to, to do that. I prepared the bills of indictment. Do you recall speaking with, with, I guess, it's Detective Gottlieb about his questions about whether that was appropriate? About? Did you hear... Um, and, Investigator Hyman testified that he and, and um, Detective Gottlieb had discussed concerns and it was his understanding that Detective Gottlieb had called you and expressed those concerns. Um, I did hear his testimony. Uh, I also recall that one of the issues that was raised in, in doing this was the question about, um, since everybody had said that Fen Colin Fennerty was at the party, or at least some people had said that, they weren't as concerned about that. But um, they were a little concerned about whether Mr. Seligman um, should be indicted because we did not have independent verification at that point that, um, that he had been at the party, although obviously subsequent, pardon me, subsequent information has shown that he was. Um, so we did, we did have that discussion. Yes, ma'am. Um, it was, I don't know the, the precise time in which that discussion was held. And then who would have made the decision to seek an indictment against Mr. Evans? I made that decision as well. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. One quick question. Mr. Yes, sir. When you didn't get the results that you had hoped for from the SBI DNA test or from Mr. Mahan's test, uh, I believe you made the statement that you were going to do things the old-fashioned way. What were you referring to when you, to a layman, what were you talking about when yes, you said yes, the old-fashioned way? Um, 
Most of my experience in trying rape cases came in the era before DNA testing. Um, and at that time, uh, pretty much what you had was the testimony of the victim in the case and perhaps some corroborating evidence. We had, sometimes we would have uh, um, forensic evidence under the old ABO system or something, not always, but so we'd be able to say, for instance, that uh, there was, uh, the, the defendant was in the uh, group, a, a, there was a 90% exclusion of people other than the defendant from a group or something along those lines. But often what we had was just the, the testimony of a victim about what had occurred, and there was no physical evidence um, that proved the identity of the, uh, of the perpetrator. Now, there, there are two kinds of, generally kinds of rape cases. One is the, the lack of consent, consent case, and the other is the identity case. And with identity what case, rape? identity, consent and identity, okay. I mean, the, the, the two ways that some, uh, either, either there was no consent, but the, the perpetrator is known, or um, there, the, in other words, the question is, since, since the victim knows the perpetrator, the defense is consent. In, in cases where the victim does not know the perpetrator, the question is usually one of identity, and we have to prove the identity um, of the perpetrator of the crime the same way you prove the, the identity of the perpetrator of any other crime through eyewitness testimony and, and things like that. And that's to what I was referring to. Well, let me ask you this. In the old-fashioned way, where you had only the accuser's testimony, it was so old-fashioned you didn't have any DNA testing, right? That's true. Well, in here, it's a little more modern. You have the accuser's testimony, and then you have also DNA testing with no direct link. Uh, think the old-fashioned way still works under that scenario? Mr. Williamson, I, I do believe that any time that you have a victim in a sexual assault case who is allowed to testify before a jury that the person who has been accused is the person who committed this particular offense, then that is sufficient evidence for a judge to send the case to a jury. I, I believe I said that earlier, that, that if you have a, a believable victim in such a case and you have enough to convince a jury beyond a reasonable doubt, it doesn't mean that you will, but that you have enough to support such a verdict. Would it be your policy today <coughs> to indict and bring to trial a rape case based solely upon the testimony of the accuser in such case that so long as you have an accuser who can identify a defendant and wants to tell her tell her story would you bring that case to trial? I wouldn't say that I would bring any such case. I think that that if you have that situation, you have to investigate the possibility of going to trial and you have to discuss with the victim all the possibilities. I don't think that you can, I think you have to look at all the facts in the case um, before you can make that determination. What facts in this case supported your conclusion that Crystal Mangum was sufficiently credible to go to trial based upon her word alone? Well, I didn't think that the testimony was based on her word alone in the sense that uh, there, was te there would be physical uh, findings from a sane nurse. There would be evidence that was consistent with post-traumatic stress. Um, there was uh, the fingernail involving Mr. Evans. Um, what, impo what importance did you place on that? Well, what did that indicate? What that, she indicated to me 
or in her. I'm sorry. My question now is what importance did you place on that DNA evidence regarding the fingernails? Well, I thought that it was important because it corroborated her statement about how the fingernails got broken off. That is, she said that she was struggling with an individual that she identified to a 90 percent certainty as Mr. Evans. And then when the fingernails were tested, the only DNA that was consistent with any of the players was his his DNA. OK, good. I think I interrupted you. I have no idea who we were. Well, I was asking you. Well, I think I got one more question. Were you personally involved in the decision to prosecute Mr. Evans? No, sir, not in the decision to prosecute. We have a policy in the office whenever in the course of an investigation or something that we come up with a an unserved warrant. It might be in the courtroom. It might be when we're running record checks on somebody. For me, sometimes it happens in traffic negotiations. Somebody come in to negotiate a traffic ticket and will want to deal with a traffic ticket. And I'll notice an unserved worthless check warrant. I said, well, I'll tell you what. You go show me this has been taken care of and we'll deal with it. It's just a policy to get all those things served, to not leave unserved warrants in our system. And so when Mr. Wilson found that, he announced it to the officers that he found out and they said they would go serve the warrant. The case came up in the normal course in district court. In this particular case, there was actually, I learned subsequently, video evidence from cameras both inside and outside the store. It was the case was several years old and apparently I'm not sure why it had been had not been served, but there was a spelling error or something in the name that could have contributed to it. But at any rate, the there was sufficient evidence to try the case. And I don't have any recollection. I know who tried the case, but I don't I don't recall talking to to her about whether the case should be tried. Were you aware that the warrant had been served and he was coming to trial? Not immediately. I think at some point that I was made aware that that case was up. By the time of the trial, were you aware that he was being tried? Probably either that on that same day. I don't know if it would have, you know, I think I think that I probably knew that day. I didn't I don't think I knew about the trial until it was over, but I may have known the previous day it was going to be tried. Were you aware that Mr. Elman Stockler was a witness to Mr. Seligman's alibi? Yes, sir, I was. Did you have any concern when you became aware that Mr. Elman Stockler was being prosecuted on an old warrant that that would somehow be detrimental to your case because it would appear to be a vindictive prosecution should this case ever come to trial and Mr. Elman Stockler testify at trial to support Mr. Seligman's alibi? I did not have any concern about that because my policy is that's what we do. I mean, we also arrested the other dancer in this case for probation violation when that came up. So she was a potential witness, you know. Well, did you have any concern with the other with the other dancer that arresting her on an old it was another old warrant? It was a probation violation. Probation violation. That bringing her in on a probation violation during an ongoing investigation of this matter might be viewed as coercive in trying to get testimony from her that was more favorable to the prosecution should she be a witness at trial? No, sir, I did not. As I indicated, our policy does not make exceptions for things. We just figured that what the way I've seen this misused in the past is to have people threatened to have a warrant served during a court proceeding. If if you bring this witness in, we know there's a warrant out there. So we're going to have the sheriff serve it. We're trying to avoid any any suggestions like that. And so my policy has just been if there if you come uncover an outstanding warrant, you get it served. We'll worry about the consequences later. So it would be your understanding that in both cases, that is with Ms. Roberts and Mr. El Mustafa, it was in effect coincidental 
that these matters came up when they did. Coincidental in the sense that, I mean, we discovered the Mustafa warrant because we got information that he was a witness, a potential alibi witness, and we're checking his background. I don't know exactly. I think the officers may have discovered the outstanding warrant on Ms. Pittman when they talked with her. That she told them about it? I don't know that she told them about it. I think they probably did the check on her and discovered that themselves. All right. I really am curious. Any further questions from counsel at this point? No, Mr. Chairman. All right. Thank you, Mr. Nyfarth. Thank you. Thank you.